Good morning. Welcome to our worship service this Sunday, the 5th of July. It's very good to have you with us. Welcome in the name of Christ. God's grace and mercy and peace be with you and also with you. A small opening prayer to prepare ourselves as we come before God our Father. God of our days and years, we set this time apart for you. Form us in the likeness of Christ, so that our lives may glorify you. Amen. Now let us sing this song, this uplifting song, Give Thanks to the Lord.
with that praise ringing in our ears and a sense of our own unworthiness before a holy God, we turn to a time of confession and saying sorry to God where we've fallen short. The grace of God has dawned upon the world with healing for all. Let us come to him in sorrow for our sins, seeking healing and salvation. Let us return to the Lord our God and all say together to him, God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus who died for us, forgive us for all that is past and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. May God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the Church's special prayer for today. Gracious Father, by the obedience of Jesus, you brought salvation to our wayward world. Draw us into harmony with your will, that we may find all things restored in him, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm pleased to say that our testimony slot this morning is being given by Claire Aston. Hi, I'm Claire. I'm recording this in the back garden because I have, I think, 15, 20 minutes while my lovely husband James cycles up the hill with George, who's in year four and therefore not at school, to collect Henry, who's in year one and therefore at school. It's one of the little gaps in my day. And that is one of the things I've learnt and I'm still learning, is to try and use these little gaps to do things that I need to do. Normally, pre-lockdown, I would have trundled off to London twice a week and had a lovely day in the office. A lovely hour on the way on the train to think about life and do my emails. A lovely hour on the way back. But in the middle of all of this, I left that job and went freelance. Which is fab, because it means I can work whenever. But I had planned to have five full school days to sit quietly at the kitchen table. Instead of which, we've all been at the kitchen table trying to work. So when Christopher asked me to think about doing a testimony a couple of weeks ago, I've been thinking about what I've learnt. And I think what I've learnt is that I'm still learning, very much still learning how this whole new world is. On the one hand, I love the fact that we're all at home with a puppy. You can hear it in the background. We're super, super lucky. We've got a lovely garden. It actually backs down to the river. So on the hot days, our neighbours have let us walk over the field and splash in the stream. On the other hand, the days that don't go very well at all. And we're all around the kitchen table pretending to work, ignoring the mess and not getting on very well at all. So the things that we're learning together as a family are how to look after each other, how to give each other a bit of space as brothers, the two of them, as husband and wife and as a family all together. Also, there's all this screen time. I don't really like it, if I'm honest. And so a lot of the work I'm doing, I'm just doing old fashioned phone calls. I'm quite good at the screen time with new people, um, but it all gets a bit exhausting. So we haven't actually shh, watched very many of these long services all together. We did at the beginning, but now we're loving the school assemblies and we watch them all the time, all together, when they come in in the week and then often again on a Sunday, choosing um, which songs to choose and sing together. The children love doing the ones um, that have all the actions that Jesus, you're my superhero, is our current favourite. So I just wanted to say we're all still learning. Our family is definitely still learning. I definitely am still learning how to be a mum and a freelance writer and a sort of teacher who's not very good at teaching and somebody who looks after a puppy and a wife. And I want to say thank you 
to the Friday morning group. It hasn't become a Friday morning group. It's been a Thursday night group. I haven't been going along to it. I don't really like doing it by screen time. But I have been um, in touch with a few of those ladies individually. And you know who you are. Thank you. And thank you for the little walk that we did last Friday. Hopefully we'll have more of those uh, in the few weeks to come. And thanks to Jan for doing the fab assemblies with Gemma. They are fantastic. Our reading today is taken from Romans 7 and is read by Pippa Blizzard. Today's reading is taken from Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 25. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. This reading will now be followed by a talk by our Vicar Jan. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we're uh, uh, thinking about Romans seven fifteen to twenty five, which you've just heard, and. Um, it's uh, 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 an extraordinary passage and um, uh, for those of you who don't know, Romans chapter 7 as a chapter is the most commented, most written about chapter in the whole of the Bible. Uh, so there are more kind of scholarly articles and books and all the rest of it on this particular chapter than on any other chapter in the Bible. Isn't that an extraordinary fact? Why? Well, it seems to divide opinion. What does it actually mean? Um, so if you heard that passage and just went, hang on a minute, what did that mean? You are in good company. Uh, the Apostle Peter in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 himself said, uh, some of what Paul writes in his letters is difficult to understand. It's hard to understand some of it. And, um, and I think he was probably thinking of, uh, he might well have been thinking of this particular letter and possibly this particular passage. So I want us to think about four uh, 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 themes for ideas that might help us to unlock the passage. And um, uh, they are these. Righteousness, Adam, laws and freedom. Which is rather neat, isn't it? Because it spells the word Ralph. So there you go, Ralph. So firstly, righteousness. Paul in this letter is writing to Jews he is trying to address some of the issues, some of the tensions that are arising out of what is essentially a Jewish sect. Um, Christianity has its root, uh, roots, of course, in Judaism. And so most of the early converts were Jews. Um, and so they would have applied what they learned about Jesus Christ to their Jewish way of life, their Jewish way of understanding the world. And one of the sticking points uh, has to do with well, what about the Old Testament law? Do we just forget about it? Now, to a Jew, that, that's just, you 
how could you? Or, you know, where, 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 what is its place in the context of the Christian faith? And so that this is one of the, 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 uh, the central themes that Paul is addressing. And connected to the idea of, of the laws is righteousness. So for a Jew, righteousness is always, uh, um, uh, it's kind of integrated, it's, it's inseparable from relationship. The concept of, of, uh, of righteousness is one to do with relationship. In other words, uh, uh, when God speaks about his people, he says things like, uh, if you will obey my commands, you will be my people. Does that make sense? In other words, righteousness isn't just something that's about us, you know, that is a, like a standalone. It's about being in right relationship with God. It's always linked to being in relationship with God. That's what righteousness is for a Jew. And righteousness as a theme runs throughout the letter to the Romans. Um, the Greek group of words that uh, are translated righteous or righteousness are, are repeated over 50 times okay, in this one letter by Paul. So this is a really important theme. And because it's linked to relationship, it, it really it defines who the people of God are. The people of God are the people, ultimately, who obey God. Who follow his commandments and of course this is repeated by Jesus if you love me you'll you'll do what I say <laughs> the people who love me are the ones who obey my commandments said Jesus uh, and so uh, here is this theme about righteousness being linked to uh, obeying the commandments but there is a problem and that's where we need to think about Adam to identify the problem so we've had relationships, um, relationship, oh, we've had righteousness. Now I want us to think about Adam. Back in a moment. Imagine for a moment that you are Adam in the Garden of Eden. And you're there surrounded by all the beauty of the Garden of Eden. Uh, every available uh, fruit is yours. And uh, you're walking with Eve. Um, Eve, for some strange reason, didn't want to appear on this video today. But um, anyway, uh, swiftly moving on. And uh, suddenly God comes up to you and he says, uh, just one little thing, that tree over there, you mustn't eat of its fruit. Okay? But the rest is entirely for you. All of it, all of it is entirely for you. Just don't eat from that tree. Okay. And so God leaves and uh, you realise you've never really noticed that tree before. But um, suddenly you start to look at it and you start thinking, wow, the fruit on that tree is actually, uh, it's really nice. I, I think, uh, hmm, no, but I, I, I mustn't. And. As the hours, the minutes and the hours go by, and the days go by, he realise he just cannot get rid of the thought of eating the fruit on that tree. I must have some. What has just come into being is the law of sin and death. The very commandments, do not eat of that fruit, brings the law of sin and death to Adam. Adam breaks the first uh, commandment that has ever been given to anyone. And uh, if you are writing to a first century Jewish audience, they know which of the Ten Commandments that commandment is. Have you guessed which one it is? It's do not covet. Do not covet. Commandment number 10, do not covet. In other words, don't desire something that doesn't belong to you, that's not for you. Is there anything wrong with the commandment that God gave them? Is it God's commandment that brings sin and death to Adam? Well, that's a question. And that's what the L in our Ralph 
is about. L is for law. And Paul talks about the law in Romans meaning the Old Testament law, but then he also talks about two greater laws, as they were, laws that affect everything. One is the law that comes into effect when Adam disobeys God by breaking the commandment, do not covet, when he takes of the fruit. And that is the law of sin and death. So, on the one hand, we have the law of sin and death, which comes about by Adam's disobedience. And in Romans chapter 5, uh, uh, Paul alludes to this, uh, refers to it rather, and uh, he then compares it to a new law, a law that can counter this law, that, 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 um, that overcomes it, overpowers it, that is a greater law which is the law of life and righteousness that comes through the obedience of Jesus Christ. Here we have the disobedience of Adam that leads to the law of sin and death. And here we have the law of obedience, the law that uh, um, we have Jesus life of obedience, which leads to the law of life and righteousness. Now, the Old Testament law's job was uh, uh, thought by the Jews to bring them that righteousness. But what they find and what is described in Romans is that just as Adam in the garden, as soon as he was given a commandment, the law of sin and death took over. So it is with all of their law and their commandments. The righteousness, that, that right relationship with God, that they so hanker after cannot be achieved by simply obeying the laws. It should be, but they just can't do it. The law of sin and death rules over them. And what is being described in verses 15 to 25 is what a life looks like when you are trying to live according to the commandments, according uh, but under the rule of the law of sin and death. We know what we want. In our minds, in our hearts, of course we desire God's presence in our lives. Of course we want him to rule over our actions, over our being. Of course we want to be members together of his kingdom. But we can't do it by obeying the law. Finally, F for freedom. If you want to understand what chapter 7 is about, uh, you need to look before chapter 7, but you also need to look what happens after chapter 7. And uh, whenever you read one of Paul's letters, one of the devices that he always uses is, is or he always uses a very big word, therefore. So he lays out his argument and he goes, therefore, this is the point I'm making, you know, think I've written all this stuff, but now therefore, whenever there's a therefore, you have to underline it and uh, memorize it and, 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 and apply it to your life. Therefore, he writes, chapter 8, verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because Christ Jesus, uh, through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Is this passage describing the ideal Christian life? No, says Paul. He says, you and I have been set free from the law of sin and death. It's really, really important. He goes on uh, uh, to say what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. The answer to the law, the, the rule of law, of the law of sin and death is 
the law of life and righteousness that Christ brings. And uh, Paul is very clear that you and I have been set free. And so uh, rather like some of these psychology uh, 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 books uh, on behavioral psychology books, self-help books, etc., it's a matter of changing our mind. We need to change our view. If, if you've ever told yourself, well, you know, I, I do my best, but I'm just an angry person deep inside. That's just how I am. Or I do my best, but uh, I, I just I just struggle with forgiveness. You know, there's one, I just can't forgive them. Or, uh, you know, I, I can't help but look at them because I just, I struggle with lust. Or, Whatever it is, you know, whether it's it's greed or it's money, whatever it is, Paul writes that you have been set free. If you are in Christ, if the Holy Spirit is in you, you are free from that. There is no good spiritual reason why you cannot change. So that should fill us with great hope. Now, in reality, of course, that is true. But you can't underestimate the fact that we are in a struggle, in a fight. I mean, Paul makes that clear, doesn't he? He says our battle isn't against flesh and blood, but against the authorities, you know, in the spiritual, in the heavenly realms. And um, so there is a battle. It Just because something is true doesn't necessarily make it easy. But let's not give up. Let's not give up. You and I can overcome anything in the power of Christ. That is given to us. Whatever our bodies and our minds, our psychology struggle with, if the spirit has been set free, then it's possible to overcome. We'll need one another. We'll need encouragement from one another, from God. We'll need to look at scripture again to help feed our souls and give us the strength to live according to what is true not according to necessarily to what's been imprinted in our in our minds. And this is why Paul says, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think again, think again. You and I have been set free from the law of sin and death. I hope that uh, Ralph <laughs> uh, uh, will be helpful next time you look at Romans chapter 7. And uh, there's lots more to say, of course. There's lots more to examine and to understand. But the message ultimately is one of hope. We've been set free because of Christ's work. Our righteousness, well, actually, it's his righteousness that comes to us. We're made righteous because he was righteous. And that should be a, a cause for celebration and for a overflowing hope. Shall we finish with a prayer? Heavenly Father, we can all think of things that we know we should do, but we don't, and things we shouldn't do, but we do. Uh, but we thank you that you have set us free from the law of sin and death. Help us to think as uh, according to the spiritual truths which we've discovered this morning. Help us to put away old messages, old lies about what we might or might not be able to achieve in your power and to step forward uh, with uh, a renewed energy and enthusiasm to step forward in faith with renewed trust in you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Inspired by that talk and the reading, let us all say together the words that affirm our faith. We believe in one God, the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that 
we are able to talk to you this morning through the name of Jesus. And we thank you for your goodness to us and the many blessings you bestow on us. Father, we thank you that the pandemic that we've all been subject to over the last few months is gradually easing and we will be able to gradually be restored to our normal way of life. We also thank you, Lord, that as your church has not been able to meet in its buildings, that it's not been ineffective, but that we've been able to have our services, Bible readings, thoughts for the day over the internet. And this has happened all over the world and proved to many people that Jesus is alive. And as we come out of this pandemic, Lord, and lockdown, we ask for your guidance to our governments and that they will be able to manage this effectively and the people of the country will respond and not take advantages too early. But Lord, we just ask for your guidance in all things. Thank you, Father, for everything. And Father, we thank you for all those people who've been working so hard to keep us safe and to keep us well. And we think especially of those that work in the National Health Service, not just the nurses and doctors, but the people who are often unsung heroes, the people that do the cleaning, the porters, those that prepare the food. And Father, we just pray that you will bless them. We thank you so much for them and their the way they put their lives at risk and put their families' lives at risk too. And Father, more locally, we pray for all those people that we know, friends, relatives, who have been at home for a long, long time, isolating, some of them on their own. And we pray that you will bless them and you will give them the courage when we're allowed to be out to gradually get back to a new normal. Some people are so frightened and Father we pray that you will just give them your strength and you'll take away their fear. And we ask that you will bless all those in our church who are working so hard to bring things to, to a much more normal footing. And we think especially of Jan and Christopher and David and all the others that are working behind the scenes so that we can meet together as, as the weeks go on. Father, we thank you for being with us. We thank you for the many blessings that we've received during this time of lockdown, for the things that we haven't normally had time to, to look at, things outside, the nature and the beautiful weather that we've had. And we thank you that there's been so much for us to be able to praise you for. And we just pray that you will bless all those people who need a special touch from you. Those who are ill, those who are frightened. And help them to know that you are with them. Because we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Can we now join together in the words of the Lord's Prayer? Our, Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed be your Lord. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, your will be done, done on earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the, the kingdom, kingdom, the power, power and, and the, the glory, glory are, are yours, yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us sing our closing hymn by the great hymn writer Charles Wesley. Love divine, all loves excelling. Joy of heaven to earth come down.
a short prayer and a blessing to close our service. Lord Jesus Christ, you humbled yourself in taking the form of a servant and obedience, in obedience died on the cross for our salvation. Give us the courage to follow you and to proclaim you as Lord and King to the glory of God the Father. Amen. The love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us in this service. May you have a joy-filled day and a blessed week.